This is something that gets asked all the time, and I'll go over it in this vid, but how do you choose pups? Uh, you know, which ones do you pick? Now, if you're just starting out, and you're getting a pup from a breeder, or, uh, you know, you're looking for a particular bloodline, you want to do as much research as you can on that breeder, or that bloodline, or that family of dogs. His or her family of dogs. Get as much information as you can. Which includes temperament, behavior, structure, uh, family history. You know, uh, as much as you can on the grandparents and the parents at least. You know, going back, the parents, grandparents. Litter mates to those parents and grandparents. Become familiar with uh, the bloodline that you choose. You know, you're gonna you're gonna uh, research what those dogs were known for. As much information as you can get. Uh, I would I would consider doing that first. You know, researching bloodlines first. Researching families of dogs, particular families of dogs. You know. Say back in the day, you know, what were Carver dogs like? What were Boudreaux dogs like? What were Boyle's dogs like? You know, or any number of breeder, whether it's in your area or somewhere else. A lot of times it's easiest to get dogs, you know, uh, in your particular, in your immediate area or at least your state. So wh whoever's breeding uh, dogs that are closer to you, if those are the ones you like, or sometimes it's just that's the only option you have, or one of the few options you had, I would still, uh, you know, research as much as that as possible. Uh, it, it could go down to what color dog you like, what size you like, you know, if you like big ones, you're going to look for this stuff, if you like smaller ones. You're going to look for this stuff, but generally the pit bull averages out as far as size goes anywhere. And it's kind of a broad uh, weight, 30 to 60 pounds, say, something like that, you know. But you can research, you know, what is the average size of that family of dogs? Uh, what bloodline is it? What does that bloodline particularly throw? All that before you even buy one dog or one pup generally people start out with pups first generally if you're not familiar with the breed or if you're not familiar with particular bloodlines you know you want to raise it up to the way you want to raise it and you want to uh you know have it do the things you want it to do for whatever particular reasons whether you want the inside outside both you know use it for confirmation legal sports hunting companionship all that you know that's what i would do first and that's what i did first that's what i did back in the day before i bought one dog out of the newspaper or from a reputable breeder or you know paper dog registered dog all that stuff is i did as much research on the breed as a whole and then on particular bloodlines which included reading books magazines corresponding with people now with the internet, we have uh, the the ability, in in most cases, not all cases, to converse with people, to <clears throat> to uh, speak with people. You know, if if somebody doesn't want to talk to you, uh, you know, don't don't take offense to it. It's just just the nature of the of how people are and not not just in dogs but everyday life you know uh, but if they're advertising something then generally they're going to talk to you because they want you know they want to make a sale and it just depends on the type of questions you ask if you ask the wrong questions they're not going to talk to you but if you ask questions you know what is the family like what is the bloodline like what's their health are there any health problems are there any uh uh temperament problems like that they'll answer all that and then you have to take it at face value uh what they're telling you and then uh go from there you know 
uh, not everybody's honest a lot of people are so uh, anybody who's in been involved with the breed knows that it costs money and sometimes that's wasted money sometimes it's lost money sometimes it's this or that but that goes with anything but as you go along you know your investments are less and your dogs get better that comes with time experience and your own particular knowledge so if you have the opportunity to visit the person to pick up the pup you know uh sometimes they'll let you pick the pup you know you're gonna you're gonna pick the one you like or or the ones that are in the litter that are available to the public you know the breeder is going to keep some for himself probably he might only have one or two available he might be getting rid of the whole litter which broadens your choices but you know, it's just a matter of going through that process. If you have been involved uh, with the breed for a while, and you have been breeding your dogs, like I did for for instance, now we're getting down to what do I like? What am I looking for in my pups, in my blood, my family of dogs? And as far as that's concerned, I liked outgoing pups not introverted pups i didn't like shy pups because there was shyness uh, in some of my dogs uh, so that pup could be uh, really animated where they do a lot of stuff they move around it could be a serious type pup it could be a a uh, dominant pup you know Serious type pup doesn't mean they're all crazy and wild, but it just means that they have a lot of confidence. So I look for things like that because that's what uh, were some of the things that made up uh, my family of dogs. And after you make your first breedings and move on like that, you start to establish in your pups certain behaviors, including their temperament. Which is why I liked outgoing pups. I liked early starters. Uh, certain behaviors, you know, pups that were weren't nippy with kids and didn't didn't uh, you know jump all over kids and and act crazy with them. Uh, I like I like pups that were eager to uh, go out and about be in public they weren't scared they weren't afraid of certain sur surfaces they weren't afraid of loud noises they weren't afraid and what i mean they weren't afraid of loud noises is i introduced all that stuff early on loud noises and a lot of moving around and seeing different people and kids and neighbors and friends and family where it kind of became normal for them to have all this stuff around and with some pups, you'll do that, and, and it scares them, and they don't really get, come out of it. They stay shy. They stay scared. So those weren't the kind I liked. I like the ones where they might react negatively a little bit or be a little bit scared, but you have the kids mess with them, and you take them out and about, and you bring them around people and all that stuff, drive them around, and take them out in the fields and exercise them and run them around with their mother when they're real small and by themselves when they get a little bit older. The ones that lead the quote-unquote pack, you know, I like those types. The ones that were curious and interactive and searching around and digging and smelling and looking, you know, paying attention to what's around them, those are the type of pups I liked. And uh, as they got older and I started exercising them, I preferred the 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 ones that enjoyed working they were eager to work that weren't lazy you know and there's a difference between being lazy and a pup or a dog being calm on the chain where they're not jumping around you know meaning when it's time to go do something they're eager to do it but in their chain spot or in their kennel spot or inside the house they may be kicked back laid back don't waste energy but I liked I liked high spirited dogs. I liked uh, pups that were that had that spirit 
and have that temperament where they're comfortable in whatever surrounding they're in. Now, as far as structure, you know, I like that Jeep structure, the stop to their forehead, half drop ears. Uh, later on, mine started coming out with bat ears. I like that, you know, because it was kind of my thing, my, the way my dogs came out, you know. I like thick, thicker bones, you know. I like the females to be thick and rugged looking like a male because for breeding purposes, they're going to carry the pup, so they needed that. Uh, I didn't like dogs, particularly on the thinner side, you know. Uh, I like them to have some leg under them. Good stifles, you know. Uh, roach back. Uh, you know, that kind of uh, straight back, too, if it, if it comes down a little bit, you know, where... where uh, the shoulders are a little bit higher than the than the rear end, you know. Some like it the opposite. Some like the, the back end a little higher than the shoulders, you know. Uh, I didn't always get this, but I like them where their feet come straight down rather than too close together. I had some that were like that. As long as they can maneuver and do what they're supposed to do, I was okay with that, you know. Good teeth, uh, even bite. If they were a little bit on the on the undershot side, that was okay. That's something that's in the breed, you know. But good, strong teeth. Some of mine had big teeth. Some of them had what you would call just average teeth. But I didn't really have dogs that had small teeth. Even the incisors and molars were good sized, you know. And the hangers and the cutters were good sized. They weren't small. They weren't, uh, you know... Uh, easy to break. The only time my dog started losing teeth, which is something in my blood too, is when they became destructive. If they fought their chain or their house or their bowl, then they would chip their teeth or break their teeth sometimes, you know. Uh, I tried to breed that out of my blood uh, as much as I could, uh, meaning I wouldn't breed two destructive dogs together like that. Or if they were a little bit shy, I wouldn't breed two shy dogs together because that's going to compound that. So I might have a destructive type dog with one that's not, that kind of fix, helps fix the problem. Same thing with the shyness, you know, one that's really outgoing and extroverted, you know, uh, uh, with one that, that's a little bit shy. And when I say shy, I just mean shy. I don't mean timid or scared or freaky. You know, you're going to get some dogs like that too. I had one like that. He was good for competition, not good for breeding. You know, so uh, those are those are the things basically uh, I look for pups, you know, and and it could even come down to to uh, uh, color, you know, what color uh, you like your dogs. You know, you've read articles and I have too, uh, where, you know, certain people, they don't like black dogs or, you know, they'll even make wild statements like, you know, black dogs quit. Or I never seen a game brindle dog, you know. Or red, red nosed dogs, they're man biters and they all quit, you know, like that. That's not true. None of that is true. You get that in all in all bloodlines, all families of dogs, you get these certain things that come out, and it's up to you to eliminate them. When you start breeding your dogs, you're gonna see the pups behaving like their parents did. And their grandparents did and their ancestors, depending on how many generations you've been breeding your dogs, how they behave when they were little. That's a good indication of how that dog is going to come out temperamentally or uh, structurally. And, and that's important. Now, you'll hear it all the time. And there's some truth to this, you know, uh, a lot of truth where, you know. All that don't matter. The pup's going to work out or it ain't. All that stuff doesn't mean anything. Which is true. All the good stuff you see in a pup. Behavior like his ancestors and all that. It can still mean the pup's not going to work out. But. Over generations. As you start breeding the pups with these behaviors. That represent their ancestors. You pretty much can guess. With a high percentage of accuracy. Which ones are going to turn out? It just makes sense that 
if their parents act that way and their grandparents act that way and showed certain traits, then they're going to do the same thing. Now, it, speaking of the past, always, if they're going to quit, they're going to quit. But again, after generations, 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 it doesn't take much, three generations, your family should be set in their behavior and temperament and traits. The patterns should be there. You have a higher chance of success if you follow those patterns that produced good dogs. You follow the traits that produce good dogs. And when you see it in your pups, you have a better chance of those pups working out than the ones that don't exhibit those traits. That's where you see uh, success and conformity and consistency over time. It's just common sense that, that if a pup's not acting like his ancestors did, he may not be the one. That may be a cull, right? And then you hear people getting into, you know, well, I let the best one go. And I sold this one. And I thought this one was going to work out and it didn't. That, that can happen anytime. You shouldn't look at that as a negative. You should look at it, well, I produced a good dog. And if you can't make more like the one you let go or you sold or you gave to your friend or whatever, then you need to check your breeding. Because if you can do it one time, you can do it again. You can do it over and over and over. And it starts when they're young, when they're pups. When you see these certain patterns, you see this certain build or, or structure. You see this temperament. You see this behavior. You see this athleticism. You see this high spirit. You see this uh, um, outgoingness in your pups. There's nothing wrong with shy pups. And in that respect, shy, timid, introverted, all that. In that respect, yeah, that doesn't mean they're not going to work out. But like I keep repeating over and over, you make the kind of dogs you want. Because on the other hand, yeah, that those puffs with those negatives, they could still work out. They could still be good dogs as adults. But so should the ones that you're choosing, that you're making the way you want them to be. That should be first and foremost. That should be at the top of your list. I want my dogs like this. I want the temperament like this. I want females that are good with puffs. I want females that are rugged looking with good teeth. Look like males, thick bone structure and hard muscle and built a certain way and behave a certain way. That's the consistency you want to be looking for. That's what you want. You won't be getting females that kill their pups and eat their pups and not good mothers and this and that. You know, for me, those were culls. I didn't want females like that. And you see that type of behavior when they're young. When they're puppies, I saw it in mine with my kids. How did they behave with my kids? As the pups were growing up, they behaved like a female, a dam, a mother should behave with their offspring. They were the same way with my children because they understood those are children. Those are babies, not little tiny babies. We didn't let the dogs around when the, when the babies were small like you see a lot of people do. It. My wife wouldn't allow that. And, and uh, you know, I had to go along with it, you know. When they start getting little older toddlers and, you know, uh, past the infant stage and like that, they could play with anything. They could pick the pup up and play with it. They were fine. But little tiny infants like that, nah, they couldn't even be in the same room with ours. That's just the way she was, and I went along with her. So you see that behavior with young females and children. And then you see that behavior... Even after you breed them before the pups are born, you see them nesting, you see them picking their spot out, choosing. If we had them in the house, uh, you know, early on, we just let them you, you used to run loose in the house. They would pick where they wanted to whelp their pups. We let them do it. We had places set up for them. Sometimes they didn't want that spot. They wanted a different spot in a different room. Most of the time it was in our bedroom. We let them. 
so the the females are cognizant of all that and part of that means that they're gonna nest they have a certain area that they want to have their pups in that they're comfortable with that's where they want to do it we let them do it and and again after breeding uh you know a few generations you see those same temperament and behaviors with other females and i can honestly say most of my field females were good with pups as long as they had their spot whether it was inside or outside they were secluded and comfortable and had enough area to move around and and the proper facilities and clean water and bedding and all that you know they were fine no 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 hang-ups no mishaps if a pup died it was because it was weak and that was a call and the mother knew it we let nature take its course in that respect we didn't run around trying to save every pup that was sickly or underweight or had problems like that no we let nature take its course because there's a reason that pup is a call and there's a reason that that female is neglecting it because she's a good mother to all the other ones that ain't sickly so she knows that that pup's going to be a problem later on health wise or whatever wise structure wise or whatever have some defect i don't know what it was we let nature take its course she knew what it was so we trusted her judgment but that's how i went around went along choosing my pups i wanted pups that had the same traits as their ancestors and if they have the same traits as their ancestors did when they were little when they grow up they're going to have the same traits as their ancestors did when they were adults that's how i did it everybody has has uh their way of doing it you know but at least i had a reason for doing things the way i did i didn't make excuses for pups i didn't make excuses for dogs i didn't and i understand why people do that you know one of the hardest things uh that i've noticed that i think people have a problem with and I respect them for it, and I understand how they feel, was culling animals. And, and which includes culling animals out of your breeding program, or just not keeping them anymore. Maybe they give it away or they sell it. They had a lot of trouble doing that. Because they, they think that every pup, every dog has a value and they do to a certain point they have a value as far as being alive goes but that doesn't mean they have a value in your breeding program doesn't mean that it'll fit with what you're trying to do and it's kind of harsh and people sometimes they have a hard time understanding that or accepting it but that's the way it is in nature that's the way it is in agriculture that's the way it is in any animal husbandry breeding uh endeavor all different kinds of animals and that's why i think they have uh, a hard time calling they just don't have the heart to do it understandable like i said but on the flip side of that if you do have those standards if you do go through that process you're going to do less culling believe me in the future you're going to have less problems. You're going to have less negatives. And it starts when they're pups. So that's just a little bit about how I chose pups or choosing pups. Everybody has their way of doing it. And uh, feel free to comment, as always. Thank you.